Hey everyone, welcome back to Pagdiriwang, an in online international conference on folklore and heritage. We hope you had a good lunch break. We will now be opening panel two of the conference. It's an honor to introduce the panel moderator for this session. She has pro Professor of Drama, Theater, and Performance Studies at De La Salle University in Manila, Philippines, where she also served as Chair of the Literature Department and Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. Please welcome Dr. Jasmine Liana. Hello, everyone. Welcome to panel two of Pagdiriwang, a conference on Christianity and popular devotion. I am Jasmine Diana from the Department of Literature, College of Liberal Arts of De La Salle University, and I am your moderator for this panel. My task is to facilitate the discussion so that we can learn and enjoy together despite our limited time. The third talk will be on the Traslacion of the Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno, also known as the Black Nazarene of Quiapo, every January 9th in Manila. Our speaker offers a counter-narrative to disparaging and condescending comments against the so-called fanatic behavior of the devotees. The presentation will highlight the various ways Bayanihan and order are manifested in the procession, highlighting the devotee's concept of salya, which is the term used for the community pushing of the andas or courage of the image to bring it to the right direction or to move it forward. He invites us to see the salya also as the cooperative spirit at work in organizing the procession unifying the church, the state, and the private sector in a shared endeavor. You probably know our third speaker or have, have seen him on TV. Michael Charleston Shaw Briones Chua teaches history at De La Salle University and is currently a candidate for PhD anthropology at the University of the Philippines. Uh, where he, he also finished his BA history and MA history. He is co-author of the books, Bonifacio, Ang Unang Pangulo, and Bayani Biographies, Andres Bonifacio. He has published various read articles in reputable academic journals in the country. Xiao was an original bottom liner in The Bottom Line with Boy Abundo of ABS-CBN from 2009 to 2012. Historical consultant of history with Lourdes on TV5 from 2013 to 2016, and Teleseries Katipunan and Illustrado uh, of GMA7 in 2013 and 2014. And he's a creator of Shout Time television segment of uh, PTV4 from 2012 to 2017, which is now an Abante Sunday column. He also writes a Saturday column for the Manila Times. Xiao Chua is one of the most active public historians on Philippine television. Makasaysayang araw po, historic afternoon to everyone. The title of my presentation would be Salya, Bayanihan and Order in the Traslacion of the Nuestro Padre, Jesus Nazareno. I would like to thank the organizers of this Pagdiriwang 
an online international conference on folklore and heritage. The UP College of Social Sciences and Philosophy Folklore Studies program, especially Dean Dr. Bernadette Abrera, my former teacher, my dissertation advisor for this topic, my mentor, Professor Dr. Carlos P. Tatel Jr., and Ms. Neem Sapalo, for allowing me to be part of this discourse and all the assistance they gave. Today is the 500th anniversary of the docking of the Magellan Elcano expedition to Philippine shores. This event will usher the introduction of Christianity in the Philippines by the Europeans. Yet, a lot of people are not so keen in celebrating its quincentennial because people felt it will be a celebration of the evils of colonialism. Call out what is wrong, sure, but extreme woke and cancel culture is just another form of Talibanism. And I dare say this, it will be detrimental to culture and heritage in the long run. History and the social sciences contextualize. That is why our work is important in enriching explanations rather, rather than simplifying them. Our ancestors are not stupid. Our culture is not weak, but flexible. We accepted Christianity not because we are Uto Uto, but because we saw patterns of our former faith in the new faith, such as the belief in the kaluluwa or the soul, and that it should show goodness and kapatiran or brotherhood. The power of healing that emanates from items and dead bodies and the sacred rituals and performances we offer as thanksgiving. We made Christianity our own. And aside from the devotion to the Santo Nino, the most popular ritual that encapsulates this appropriation or pagangkin of the Christian faith is the devotion to the Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno de Quiapo. And the translation procession held every 9th January in Manila. Contrary to popular legends that the Nazarene is black because it survived the fire, a kind of dark wood was used to carve it. Its color made it even more attractive because in this representation, the Lord looks like us who suffered the humiliation of crucifixion as we also suffered the yoke of colonialism. This is God who made pakikipagkapwa tao with us and therefore understands us. But each, what each of us know that, th that his death is not the end of the story. Just as the Lord was resurrected after three days, we too will find an end to suffering towards healing and redemption. According to some historians, this narrative actually inspired people to fight for freedom and redeem their country, aside from just being an opium of the people. Translacion is the Spanish word for transfer. The possession of the Señor from Luneta's Quirino Grandstand or Independence Grandstand back to Quiapo commemorates how the original Mexican image of the suffering Lord carrying his cross, which was once housed at what used to be the Church of St. John the Baptist at the Luneta, was transferred after some time to the Recoletos Church in Intramuros, the supposed original burned during the Second World War. A replica of this original was made and was handed over to the present church in Quiapo, now the Basilica. And during the time of Archbishop Basilio de Santa Justa y Rufina in 1767 or 1787, depending on what uh, article you're reading, it must be clarified that although the procession of the Black Nazarene around Quiapo is already 200 year or so tradition, the translation itself is a recent invention, which idea only started in 2007 to commemorate the 400 years of the coming of the recollect priests who introduced the image later on, and then was finally called Traslacion in 2009, after which it had become an annual event. But those who lack understanding somehow throws negative light to the action of the devotees. For example, order and bayanihan, or helping each other, united together, are words that people will not easily associate with Kiapo or the Black Nazarene. Television footage seemed to show hundreds of thousands of fanatical devotees at one time scrambling 
to get near the andas of the Senor. They wanted to have their hankies be touched to the image to acquire power and healing as our ancestor did, ancestors did to Devanitos. Some people notice how selfish some devotees are as they stepped on others just to get near the image. Devotees are quickly judged as illogical, chaotic, and crazy. But Monsignor Jose Clemente Ignacio, the former rector of Quiapo Church who developed the Traslacion as we know it today, said that to understand the devotion, one must be a devotee. Victor Turner described in his articulation of the ritual process the devotees at a certain stage of devotion enter liminality, a phenomenon that takes us away from all our daily lives where the notion of time, class, and divisions are suspended. In this, we reenact the crises and struggles that brought us together in the faith. In the Black Nazarene Translation, everyone around the Andas seems to be in a trance, in a semblance of unity and equality where everyone is barefoot. Communitas is achieved. As a visual people with a penchant for drama and soap opera, the possession of the Black Nazarene became a way for Filipinos to visually dramatize their faith. A crowd management expert dubbed the procession a simulated choreographed craze, seeming chaos that is created by the calculated and collective action of the people. Certain hand signs are used by the ihos to direct the devotees in pushing the andas forward. There is a coda that the devotees understand. The word salya is shouted and devotees run together and use the force of their bodies to slam the andas to move forward or to put it into order. Also, the people around the andas called pinga, which used to be the term for the handle of the andas at the sides, allowed themselves to be stepped upon as a form of penitence as they help others climb as well. This is also manifested every translation in Quezon Boulevard area when devotees let other people step on them so they could cross the other side of the road for free as a way of pamamanata or devotion. And despite hundreds of thousands of namamasans wanting to climb the andas, there are in average less than 500 injuries annually and for many years, zero procession related deaths. Ano pa yan? Uh, uh, high blood lang. Uh, blood pressure. Because there actually exists a system, a certain way of going to the throng or going under the rope to avoid being wounded and to avoid wounding others, putting your two hands in front of your chest area. A certain way to go with the flow of the crowd, which are like waves in the river, reminiscent of the fluvial processions in this maritime culture. A way of calling for help by raising one's hand if one helps one wants to be removed from the throng. They will be swiftly raised up by their fellow devotees to safety. A way for a hanky that is thrown to a member of the ihos, it would return to the person who owns it after being wiped to the image. Kasi dami ng tao na yun. And when it became the trans translation, now when it became the translation, the procession was elevated from a local event to an international pilgrimage. Hype up by constant and intensified media coverage. But there was already a system of coordination developed through the past 12 years between the parish authorities on the Alpa level, the local government unit or the Bravo level, and up to even the regional and national level or the Charlie level in planning the procession and responding to any eventualities. At the Quiapo Church Command Center, assisted by the Center. Next slide, please. There. That's the Quiapo Church Command Center. I had observed in my ongoing seven-year study how re relatively smooth these relationships are despite the different interests of each one. For example, it was interesting for me to see church leaders who are critical of the excesses of the drug war work hand in hand in camaraderie with policemen to implement it, all for the sake of ensuring the safety of everybody. 
it is actually interesting to see the different sectors of society, the church, the government, the armed services, the NGOs, the business sector, the devotees, even the informal sector, including the Merons and the Uzis of the Uziseros, also known as the bystanders. The whole Bayan actually working together to ensure the success of the event. One can see that this is the perfect manifestation of what Marcel Maus dubbed as the total social phenomenon or the total social fact. That event, the event that affects and makes the whole society work. But for me, this is Filipino Bayanihan at work. The pandemic ushered in a new way of devotion by social distancing, caring for others or following the basic health protocols, successfully implemented by the Quiapo Church and focusing on the Holy Mass. According to authorities, there was no spike in COVID cases that would be attributed to the last fiesta. Its Facebook masses offered comfort to the devotees, even in foreign lands. That is why recently it was confirmed it has become top two social media influencer in the country, a true phenomenon. With this, we see that the concept of Salya and the whole procession itself encapsulate both our concepts of order and bayanihan. If we put it in a macro level, the whole translation itself is a phenomenon that is animated by the people, the church, and the government. Sinasalya ng buong bayan to its intended orderly and safe conclusion. So, how can we not celebrate as a nation ng buong bayan, our Christianity, when it had become part of who we are? Should we cancel ourselves? Thank you. Uh, let's let's begin with the Jose Martin Singh from UP Diliman. To any of the panelists, if one were to superimpose a Catholic theological dogma slash doctrine anachronistically, say the divine possessions of the Trinity with affective elements of native animism found in Anito worship. How should one view this clash of contradictory sources of truth, given that they are ever-present in the individual who is also part of the constant changes of his or her community? Uh, can I answer? Anyone? Ah, sige, yeah, I'd like to contribute to also. Yes. yes. Um, I think uh, this is where I, you see, as social scientists, there are many perspectives to the truth, okay? And uh, you see, all of these understandings are experiential in many ways. And in many ways, the church in the Second Vatican Council, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think Lumen Gentium, uh, recognizes what we call the, um, the faith, uh, the sense of the faithful or the sense of the faith, sensus fidelium and the sensus fidei, where, where the understanding that comes from the people. Now, of course, there are some people who say that these uh, animist uh, practices are now, shall we say, pu purified as in, because this is the church that is in need of a purification center, semper purificanda. But for me, that's why as, as, as an anthropologist, I do not want to impose a certain perspective in every, in, in, in what I, in, in, in every, every time I look at these devotions. I want to look at the heart. Yeah, in how, how people express their faith. And uh, I think that's, that's a better way of uh, looking at it because some, some might not be totally dogmatic about it, but you have, you know, genuine faith in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, yeah, and maybe Father Alejo can give us a more theological take on it. <clears throat> well, um, thank you very much for the question. The, the question is posed very in a very complex way, but uh, I've been struggling with that also and my approach is through my philosophy of loop and it can be enriched by uh, 
this relational ontology because law is not a structuralist uh, space within but it is uh, it is an ontology that is relational law can be understood if you come in yung sinasabi nga ni ano ni ni Xiao so uh law is seen from seen from the outside could be a small space that is enclosed but like in bah bahay kubo when you come in after knocking on the door and you you are allowed in and the windows are open then the even the surroundings are part of the experience the ontological experience of loob and i think this is a very fertile uh, concept for understanding for example the the trinity how the loob of the father loob of the son and loob of the spirit are nagkakaisang loob nagkakapalagayan Uh, loob. And uh, I think the relational uh, spirit, uh, ontology could be very helpful. As a matter of fact, when one of my essays on loob has been translated uh, into English, my translation of the title was loob um, relational interiority. <laughs> I think that's related to relational ontology. And you, you need to, to have a sympathy for the devotees. in order to understand devotion. So thank you for that. And again, it's another area for research. <laughs> But the, the beautiful yeah, thing is, uh, maybe the challenge is for the theologians to do ethnographic field work in order to understand, <laughs> for example, the intricacies of uh, joining uh, joining the, the translation. You know? right. But at the same time, there is also a corresponding challenge. Well, may... Well, a good number of theologians uh, enroll in anthropological subjects. Uh, maybe the challenge is for some anthropologists to also read some theological <laughs> articles uh, for mutual enrichment. Right. Thank you. I, Julius, I Dr. Dr. Bautista, yes. I want to echo what uh, Paring Bird said in, in my response. I think that there is a great underestimation of the, uh, of the lines of communication between Uh, the members of the institutional church and social scientists, especially anthropologists. Um, I think the, the question is framed as though uh, these, these kind of different, uh, what is it, uh, sources of truth are, in, uh, are kind of uh, dichot is a dichotomy that can, uh, it's very difficult to kind of um, resolve. But there's actually a great deal of porosity between these two um, spheres of, of understanding religion. Um, and I think that... Uh, People like uh, Paring Bird and people uh, like Dr. Sapitula uh, are personifying this, uh, this porosity by not just doing social science, but by, uh, by, by, try, by trying to do, to do social science from, uh, from a kind of organic perspective. Um, so I, I very much echo uh, Paring Bird's um, uh, call for, for more convergence between theology and, uh, and social science, because I think that there's actually... A, deal of uh, intersubjective potential. So to answer the question, how should one view this clash of contradictory sources of truth? My answer would be with great optimism, because there is, mm -hmm. there is already a number of people who are talking about um, making, this kind of, um, making this kind of approach to, to understanding religiosity, not just in the Philippines, but I think uh, broader in religious studies. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have time for just two more questions and uh, lined up our question from Joycey Alegre and another one from Bri, uh, Bri Birai. All right, let's begin with a question from Joycey. Mabuhay po ang ating mga tagapagsalita, paring Bert, Dr. Bautista, and Shao Chua sa kanilang pagpapayabong ng diskurso. ukol sa konsepto ng banal at pananampalatay. Magaling po ang inyong pagpapahayag at kapansin-pansin ang inyong pagtalakay. Sa inyong pagtalakay, ang inyong self-reflexivity as yourselves to agree being insiders, religious culture of your study. Maari po bang po ba kayong magkomentaryo ukol dito sa inyong critical position gayong kayo ay maaaring perhaps devotee or practitioner at the same time? 
sort of oscillating between the critical and the practitioner slash believer uh, scholars. So this is Joyce Alegre, Culture and Performance Studies Specialist ng UP Tacloban. May I begin? Maraming, maraming salamat yes. sa yung tanong, Joyce. Uh, I, I interpret this question as a methodological one. Uh, I have uh, been trained as an anthropologist um, who has decided to, to look at a society that I had at least once called my home, Cebu. No? Um, so the, the question of whether or not I'm an insider or not to the object that I study is also a little bit iffy for me. But there came a point in my, uh, in my scholarship where I decided that that, that kind of um, discussion about self-reflexivity is uh, on the whole a productive one. Because mm. at, uh, at the logistical level, at the very least, logistically, uh, it enables you to kind of uh, engage with, uh, with interlocutors in a more human way. You know, it's not, it's not sort of approaching uh, the study from a high analytical angle, but rather kind of coming at it from, uh, from a, I, I would say, a, a humble, a more humble sort of perspective. Um, and I think in the end, uh, that is the source of a very, very interesting uh, anthropological insight. Uh, let me just reference that this uh, question of self-reflexivity is a very big question in anthropology and remains to be a big one. And I don't think that you will find a resolution of this question anytime soon. But what I'm saying is that I've stopped finding a resolution. I've stopped sort of being concerned with finding a result, resolution between insider and outsider, but rather focusing more on the kind of human component. That's it. I would like to agree with uh, Dr. Bautista because uh, I believe that uh, there is acknowledgement already in the social sciences of uh, being, you know, having agenda, having uh, perspectives that are coming from your background. This is like pagpopook in pantayong pananaw. And uh, as a, uh, for, for example, yes, I, I have stopped uh, thinking about it. I just want to observe. I am not, I, I'm not a devotee of the Black Nazarene. In fact, I'm a Protestant Christian. No? But when I was uh, a young boy, my mother na pinanata niya ako to the Black Nazarene. So I have great respect for the Black Nazarene devotion. I'm not a Catholic anymore, but I have great respect for it because it is the faith that sustained my mother. So I want to understand the heart of my mother. And that's why I understood the heart of my mother through the eyes of the devotees. And I think that was an enriching experience. I will just write what I want to write. I'm, port to, I'm um, very, very honest about my positioning here. And uh, let the readers decide if, uh, the, if my study in the future would be useful. I hope to finish <clears throat> it soon. 